Welcome to Frazier and Dieter's Culture of Compliance podcast series, where we discuss compliance as a competitive advantage in today's marketplace. I'm Sabrina Serafin, partner and national leader of Frazier and Dieter's Process Risk and Governance Department. Today, we're talking about a compliance issue that many employers are facing this year for the very first time. With employees working remotely as the norm, many have opted to shift their work location to a place far from the office, which could have tax implications. Today, I have with me two of Frazier and Dieter's experts in what tax professionals call global mobility. Jonathan Clark is with our UK practice, and Kristen Pop is part of our tax team in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Sabrina. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, Johnny. Uh, Johnny, can you get us started by first describing to our audience what the term global mobility means to a tax professional? Sure. So global mobility is all about the movement of people and ensuring your employees are tax compliant in the location where they're working. Now, if we look back as little as a couple of years, the main types of employee movement that I would typically support my clients with as a global mobility advisor were business travelers, where you may be sending employees for a short period of time to visit another country for ad hoc meetings, You have the formal international assignment where an employee may apply for a visa and be temporarily seconded from one country to another from anywhere from six months to three years plus. And you also have the permanent international location where someone might physically uproot their home, their family, and take up a new contract um, overseas in a different country. Now, with the rapid increase and uptake of remote working technology that has come about from COVID-19, with everything from video conference software that we're using today to secure cloud storage. We've also seen the emergence of a new type of globally mobile employee, which is commonly referred to as the remote worker. This is someone that can perform their day-to-day role from anywhere, including a different country to where their employer is based. Okay, can we talk more about those remote workers and what tax compliance issues employers may need to consider? Yes, of course. Well, so firstly, I think it's important to split remote workers into two different types of categories. I would would say you have the simple remote workers where you may have employees working remotely from home and that home or remote work location is in the same country or state to where their employer is based. You then have the more complex international remote workers. These are employees who may be working remotely from a different country Um, altogether from where their employer is based. For example, they could have a UK-based employer, but but be remotely working from somewhere in Spain. Now, it's for these types of international remote workers, there are three separate tax compliance areas that need to be considered. Firstly, there's the personal tax implications for the employee as an individual. And this includes everything from looking at the individual's tax residence position, which determines where their income could be taxed, uh, looking at their social security, and also looking at where they might have an obligation to make or file tax returns. You then have the employer tax obligations, and this could be everything from payroll reporting, tax reporting that the employer needs to comply with for that employee working remotely overseas, For example, you could have a situation by having an employee working remotely in a different country, that employer now has a payroll obligation in that overseas country, which they didn't have before. And then finally, we have the corporate considerations. Now, these are less common type of issue that we come across, but depending on the role of the employee, they could create what is known as a permanent establishment or a taxable presence in the overseas country where they're working. And that could create some sort of corporate filing or reporting responsibility. Now, these are most common where you've got workers who are concluding sales contracts on behalf of their business in an overseas country. Okay, that's interesting. I I know we have some people who have literally worked for months this year from a second home in a different state. Uh, Kristen, are there similar tax implications in the United States? Yes. So in addition to having the international tax implications, we in the U.S. will also have to look at states and determine if there is a state nexus for the employees 
which would for once make the employee taxable in that state on a personal level and also may trigger withholding obligations for the employer. Um, for COVID-19 related remote working arrangements on behalf of out-of-state employers, we have some states that have waived the creation of business nexus for state taxes. Um, currently those states mostly include Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, North Dakota, and Washington DC. So if those employees become residents in the respective states, there may still be a withholding requirement in the resident state, but there won't be any withholding requirement in the non-resident state. If we take Minnesota as an example, and we just say we have an employee temporarily working remotely in Minnesota due to COVID restrictions or COVID related, but the employer is located in Iowa. The Minnesota Department of Revenue will not assert business tax nexus against the Iowa business. So as a guideline, employers should monitor for once where employees globally, but they also need to focus where they are located within the US during these times. Okay, so this concept has implications for both global organizations and organizations here in the United States with an employee base that shifted around this year. Johnny, could you talk us through some of the questions that employers should be asking themselves when they find themselves in this situation? Yes, of course. So firstly, I would say, do you know where your workforce are? So do your staff come to the office each day? Do they work from home? Is that home in the same state or country as where you're based? Um, have they been working from a holiday home in a different country or state during lockdown? Or even have they been working somewhere exotic like an Airbnb on the French Riviera? Um, once, you've, once you've answered those questions, secondly, do you need to have a policy for your remote workforce? And will you need one going forwards? For example, will this be available to all employees or just employees at certain levels within the business or employees performing certain roles within the business? Some work, some remote working arrangements may have been temporary during lockdown, or some may have been so successful that you, you intend to run these as more permanent arrangements going forwards. Once you've taken stock of your work, where your workforce is based and where they could be based going forwards, I would next say, have you considered if you were being compliant from a tax perspective? And that touches on the points we mentioned earlier about the personal tax, the employer obligations, and also the corporate considerations. Now, obviously, as a business and employer, you mainly care about your employer responsibilities, such as payroll um, and maybe even corporate obligations. But it's important to know that the employee's personal tax situation can sometimes impact your employer obligations, so it can't be dismissed. And then finally, I would say that if you are thinking about having remote working as a more permanent arrangement for your workforce going forwards, what process do you have for going forwards for identifying this in your workforce, so picking them up, and then also tracking them to ensure you identify that compliance at the start, but keep it going right through to the end. So Johnny, it's, it's important that employers take stock of where their workforce currently are to see if any current remote working arrangements are temporary or permanent? That's exactly right. Um, once you've taken stock of where your workforce's current location is, you can then identify any specific cases which may require retrospective action or subsequent attention. For example, I had a, a recent client of mine where we did an exercise to identify their remote workforce and effectively applied a RAG rating to this, so red, amber, green, of cases which require no attention, amber, something that might require attention in the immediate future, next six months if nothing was to change, and also red, where there might be some employer obligations now. Kristen, for employers with a U.S. population, what steps should they take to avoid any kind of tax surprises down the road? Besides the state tax implications, which we talked about, we have 
two scenarios. We have foreign employers who have employees on assignment in the US um, and therefore we will have to look at the residency rules in the US. Employees who are in the US for certain amounts of days during the current year and also looking back on a three year period may become residents because they were unable to leave the US. An eligible individual who intended to leave the US but was unable to do so due to COVID-19 emergency travel disruptions may exclude up to 60 days of presence in the US. On the flip side, we have the second scenario where we have US employers with employees overseas. And those employees had to return from overseas due to COVID and are now working back in the US. We will also have to look at the withholding requirements for employees who would have been eligible to claim the foreign earned income exclusion. So if employees were required to leave a country between February 1st and July 15, or December 1st and July 15 for China and Hong Kong, those employees may still be able to claim the foreign earned income exclusion. Both of the above scenarios apply to the movement between the US as home or host country and the respective foreign home or host country. What employers also need to look at is employees who left the host country but did not return to their home country. So if we have an employee who was an assignment from the US to Singapore, and that employee may have chosen to locate to Australia instead of returning to the US, um, this may not only have implications for the personal tax of the employee, but may result in withholding requirements in the foreign country, or in some cases, as Jonathan already mentioned, it may even create a permanent establishment for the US employer in that foreign country. Employers should definitely keep close track on the location of their employees and be aware of the implication those movements between countries may have. Thank you, Kristen. Now, as we record this podcast in late 2020, many parts of the world are once again under orders to shelter in place. So the impact of employee mobility issues will be relevant for next year as well. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts for our audience as we venture into another year of uncertainty with COVID? Um, yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Uh, well, firstly, I'd say that unfortunately with global mobility, there is no one size fits all solution to an international workforce. Um, each employee's personal situation can be unique and may, be, may need to be looked at on a case by case basis as local tax and reporting rules vary from country to country, such as the US, the UK, and also in the case of the US from state to state. But I would say to counter that, is I, and I would like to say to our audience, is that global mobility and a remote workforce isn't something they should be afraid of. Yes, it can create some additional compliance obligations, but the overall positive positives in terms of employee engagement, attracting talent, expansion and growth opportunities for a business can be huge and really positive. Finally, I would like to say, and this is from experience with Kristen and myself, that it's always best to be proactive in getting good global mobility advice at the start, as it allows both the employer and the employee to plan efficiently and also avoid any unexpected tax liabilities or surprises down the road. Well, Johnny and Kristen, thank you for joining us again today with some very timely information about a compliance challenge that many people and some organizations have not yet recognized. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to Fraser and Dieter's Culture of Compliance podcast. And please join us for our next episode as we continue to discuss transforming compliance requirements into investments in your business. Thanks for listening to one of Fraser and Dieter's branded podcasts. To learn more, connect with us on LinkedIn or visit us at FraserDieter.com and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.